everybody. My name is Robin Silvestri. I'm the executive director at Save the Great South Bay. And uh, welcome to our speaker series. We're going to have Todd Shaw, uh, president of the organization, kick off with some welcome remarks. Mike is yours, Todd. Thank you, Robin. Uh, thanks for everybody for joining us this morning. And thanks and, and welcome to our first installment of the Great South Bay speaker series for 2022. Um, we have uh, we have a couple very exciting. I just want to just talk about really quick our next three speaker series that are coming up. Um, uh, in May, we have an eelgrass speaker series, which uh, should be amazing. Obviously, everybody that grew up on the Great South Bay, you know, knows of uh, having to stop their boat every 300 yards in order to back out their uh, back out their prop with eelgrass, and that's really not happened over the past couple of decades. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, the next one is in August, uh, which is Creeks' Classrooms, which is one of our major initiatives uh, and always has been is to get the children involved, uh, get them off the couch, get them down to their local stream and creek and understand where they live. Uh, you know, don't have to worry about necessarily the polar bears or the polar ice caps, but, uh, you know, do something about their local streams, get them involved, get them wet and dirty. And that's one of the um, one of our major initiatives. Uh, that's in August, uh, where we get uh, all the science. Well, we invite all the science teachers on the South Shore of Long Island to uh, to uh, to join us and, and learn a little bit more about um, Brookhaven National Laboratories uh, uh, Day in the Life program and, and and many other things. It's a, it's a wonderful day. Uh, and then in October, we're having our second or third annual Robin um, State of the Bay with uh, Dr. Christopher Gobler from SOMAS uh, at uh, Stony Brook, which we're always very excited about and to understand exactly, um, you know, the makeup of, of the Bay for the year and, and what the outlook looks like. So uh, with that, I just want to spend a couple seconds just talking about the organization. We have three, actually four very specific uh, agenda items that we do at, at Save the Great South Bay. The first one is the Creek Defender Program. I can see we have a bunch of Creek Defenders online today. Um, we have uh, 16 towns that um, form uh, basically the Great South Bay. Uh, we, it's our loose interpretation, but we feel it's from Massapequa to Mastic. It's probably from Seaford to Mastic, but you know, basically the Carmen, Carmen's River kind of ends the Great South Bay. But we now have installed 16 Creek Defenders in each one of those 16 towns. We feel that a local presence, a hyper-local presence, in each one of those towns brings a uh, an unbelievable amount of pride and an unbelievable amount of just you know connection within the community to be able to uh, to make some change and we uh, we're finding that that's really true um, and there's 50 creeks actually 50 natural uncut creeks that flow into the Great South Bay along those 16 towns um, the second is native plantings uh, we are very um, uh, we're, 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 we're big advocates of native plantings. Uh, in, in a couple pro, couple programs under there is our Sump to Sanctuary program. There are hundreds of sumps in on Long Island that we're looking to convert and to have sponsored uh, to make um, more useful uh, and um, you know particularly as landing pads for uh, native species and uh, pollinators. Um, and the second one is our Bay Friendly Yards program where we just encourage everybody to keep, take a small patch of their uh of their land and uh and just make it native and uh you know that helps really helps with the quilt and the patchwork of pollinators and native and uh and um and native uh birds uh and then the third was our great south bay oyster sanctuary which uh, we are very proud of we kicked off uh i guess a year ago now uh greg rivera is uh is on today and john hall who were, were both um actually, uh, you know, very instrumental in helping us, helping us um, with that program. And, uh, and that's ongoing. And that's one of the reasons why we have this today. Uh, and uh, so going into the greater mission of what we do, we love to just bring everybody together, all of the constituents throughout Long Island that that have a common intent and purpose, because once everybody's in the same room, and hopefully the next one will be in the same room as we've done every single other one at the Lessings, uh, they've been so unbelievably generous to give us um, the ability to use the view where we have an hour's uh, worth of coffee uh, and uh, networking where everybody can speak together and kind of talk about their projects and what they're doing and then an hour of great content. So that's what we're going to look to get to next time. Um, with that, uh, Robin, I'll hand it off to you uh, with this wonderful spirit series that you put together and um, 
take it away, please. Thank you, Todd. Thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, as you said, I'd like to welcome some of our special guests here today. We have representatives from municipal leaders. Our local politicians are represented from the assembly, uh, from the two senators' office that um, about the Great South Bay. We have representatives from multiple nonprofits that are uh, leading up oyster projects from Cornell Cooperative, Friends of Bellport Bay, the Gino Macchio Foundation is with us on the line, uh, the Peconic Baykeeper, um, save, the, save the Sound, our, our colleagues up on the North Shore, and it's really great to have everybody in the same room. As Todd said, the purpose of the speaker series is to bring everybody together so that we can learn from each other's experience and, and share our ups and downs and uh, how to move best forwards. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. Today, we have some distinguished guests joining us, um, including Michael Dole, who's the Associate Director of Bivalve Restoration from Stony Brook's University's um, School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Michael um, leads projects to improve Long Island's coastal waters and fisheries through shellfish restoration and restorative aquaculture. As both a career research scientist and commercial oyster farmer, Mike brings a unique perspective and combination of skills to his work that contribute to the development of science based in the water solutions to coastal environmental problems. Over the past 20 years, Mike has designed and implemented restoration and aquaculture projects in dozens of locations throughout New York waters from the Hudson Rar Raritan Estuary to the Eastern Bays of Long Island. Most recently in his current position, Mike has helped lead efforts to build restored oyster reefs and hard clam and oyster spawner sanctuaries in Long Island Bays as both as part of both the Shinnecock Restoration Program and the Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project. Mike has been a strong advocate of shellfish and seaweed aquaculture as a tool to improve coastal water quality uh, and over the past several years has developed and refined techniques for shallow water kelp farming off the coast of Long Island. So welcome, Michael. You have some tremendous experience uh, to contribute to the conversation. We're excited to have you here today. Joining us also is Greg Rivara, aquaculture specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County and lead marine biologist on the Great South Bay Oyster Project. Greg was hired in 1986 as the aquaculture specialist for Cornell Cooperative. He works primarily with commercial shellfish farmers across all 10 towns in Suffolk and two in Nassau to help um, with siting and permitting a shellfish farm, as well as performing applied research and extension to, both benefit, to benefit both commercial and municipal shellfish growers. Greg has his BS in marine science biology from Southampton College and an MS in marine environmental science. He has been involved in many local and national shellfish related organizations and is currently the chair of the Shellfish Advisory Committee at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, which makes the needs of the shellfish industry, both farmed and wild caught, known to the DEC, as well as to the municipal programs. Greg was the first CCC employee to work at the Suffolk County Marine Environmental Learning Center when it was transferred to Suffolk Community College in 1991. He founded a shellfish hatchery, hatchery there and still serves three, which still serves three East End towns providing shellfish seed and related educational programs. Welcome, Greg. Uh, again, we're really excited to have you here. An important part of the conversation is um, aquaculture, of course. So continuing on, we have um, uh, Thomas Schultz, co-founder and president of Friends of Bellport Bay. Bob's main mission is to collaborate uh, with the community, municipalities, and environmental organizations to rehabilitate and restore the shellfish populations in our bays effectively and efficiently. To date, FOB has planted approximately 2 million shellfish on the Bay Bottom out in Bellport Bay and has successfully lobbied for and was granted a four acres town management area in Bellport Bay. We're uh, looking to find out how more about how you did that, Thomas. Um, there they can plant shellfish in a zone officially deemed off limits to shellfish harvesting and a healthy bay ecosystem begins with a, a viable and robust shellfish population. They are now planning to scale up their shellfish restoration for 22 and beyond. Uh, welcome, Thomas. 
Our fourth panelist and a really important part of the conversation, I can't even stress how grateful we are to have them on the line with us, is uh, Wade Carden and Chelsea Miller. Marine resource, um, Wade is the Marine Resource Specialist at the New York State DEC. He started with the Division of Marine Resources in 2007 as a seasonal laborer in the Shellfish Management Unit. Glad to hear people from the, from the ground up, Wade while completing the MS program in Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University under uh, Dr. Bassem Alam in the Marine Animal Disease Lab. In 2008, he took a biologist position in the Shellfish Management Unit and managed the Marine Aquaculture Permitting, Shellfish Transplant, and Shellfish Disease Monitoring programs. In 2018, he became the unit leader and has been heavily involved in managing the Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project the largest project of its kind undertaken in New York to date, which is expected to conclude in 2023. And finally, to welcome um, our moderator for today, we have Barry Udelson, a Marine Resource Specialist from Cornell Cooperative. Barry has a degree in marine biology from Southampton College and a master's in biology from Long Island University at Post he has a diverse background and has worked in the marine science field for 17 years, including positions with the National Marine Fisheries, the Virgin Island Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Park Service. He has worked for a Cornell Cooperative for over 10 years on various projects, including eelgrass and salt marsh restoration, horseshoe crab monitoring, and he manages various shellfish related projects in Western Suffolk County. Barry has been developing rib mussel aquaculture and restoration at Cornell Cooperative for the past five years, as well as a community shellfish gardening program. Building off of the partnership with the Friends of the Bay and Cold Spring Harbor and Oyster Bay, Barry is starting another program in Huntington and Northport Harbors, where community members are getting involved in raising oyster spat on shell, which will be used to create new oyster sanctuaries in these water bodies. Barry works closely with the DEC, as well as various stakeholders, such as local baymen, community members that are interested in the water quality improvement projects and, and habitat restoration. So as you can see, we've got a wide, um, a wide swath of speakers with a variety of experience that, um, that will help facilitate our conversation. Um, so with that, Barry, I'd like to... Um, hand the mic over to you. I ask everyone to please hold your questions until the end. They will likely get answered as we go along. Uh, this is more of a round table conversation between the moderator and our, and our uh, panelists. Um, you can put your questions in the chat and we'll direct them over to Barry for the Q&A session. Thank you very much. You're, it's all you, Barry. All right, thank you, Robin. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, thank you to our panelists. I mean, great wealth of knowledge here. And this is such an interesting topic and it's becoming more and more prevalent with the interest and um, support from so many local people wanting to try to find ways to give back and be improving our water qualities and stuff. And it's hard to understand ways to do that. So by leaders like you and programs that you're involved in, um, this, this is a, a great forum to get some of these questions answered. And um, like Robin said, bring so many members from both sides of the island together um, that are all interested in the same purpose. Um, so today we're breaking the topic up of oyster um, sanctuaries into a couple of different segments since it's such a big topic. So today we're kind of focusing on the evaluation of potential sites. Um, so in order to plan an oyster restoration project, it's, it's important to understand how oysters reproduce and create reefs in nature. Um, so I'm gonna start with Michael. Um, do you want to explain the, the life history of oysters and how this uh, results in the formation of oyster reefs? Sure, yeah, thank you, Barry. Um, and thank you, Robin and Todd and uh, everybody from Save the Grout, Great South Bay for inviting me and hosting this event. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, yeah, so if that's, that's a good first question because the life history of oysters really underpins the strategies and uh, for everything about um, how, to, how to restore an oyster reef, including site selection. So very briefly, if we start with a, adult oysters, there are separate sexes, there's males and females. Um, they will spawn into the water 
they're broadcast spawners, so they'll spawn eggs and sperm into the water. And that's where fertilization happens in the water column. And the first life stage is a larval, a planktonic larval stage that really looks nothing like an oyster. Um, they're called villagers. And this is a really um, uh, crucial part of the life cycle, and especially for planning restoration projects. The planktonic larvae are in the plankton for about two weeks before they metamorphose and settle. And they can swim a little bit, but pretty much as a plankton are at the mercy of the currents. And from where they're spawned, the location of, of where they're spawned is not necessarily where they're gonna set. So in two weeks in the bay with, with tidal currents and wind-driven currents, um, they can be dispersed pretty far. And, but when they are ready to settle, there are certain um, cues they'll use to find the appropriate place to settle. And oysters like to settle on a hard substrate and most often preferably on shell. That, that's one of the cues. <clears throat> And uh, another important part of life history is once they metamorphose and set into an oyster, that's it, they're sedentary. So unlike lots of other different bivalves, oysters don't move uh, once they're set. And so um, it's really emphasized the importance of picking um, a good area for a reef. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll end that there. And, um, uh, but I think two important things in the life cycle, just to keep in mind, is that larval stage where there's going to be transport and dispersion throughout the estuary. Um, and then just also the fact that oysters are sedentary. And so once they are set, that's where they're going to be for the rest of their life. Great. Thank you, Michael. And maybe one point of distinction we can make for people so that they understand um, oysters that we eat that are often found in restaurants. They don't look like they're attached to anything, whereas oysters that, as you described, they're sedentary, so they attach to something out in the field. You want to just touch on the, this, the difference that occurs within hatcheries so that they understand how that they're so nice and easily handled at a restaurant, whereas in nature, they, they kind of attach to all these rocks and things like that. Yeah, you want me to follow up on that, Barry? Oh. Yep. Um, Sorry, Michael. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, in nature, oysters will settle. And that's, I, I forgot to point out too, that's how in nature, over time, over centuries, reefs can form um, these three-dimensional structures in the water because oysters tend to like to set where other oysters are. So that's a cue. And um, with multiple generations setting on top of each other, these structures will elevate and build over time. In a hatchery, oyster larvae are set on what's called culch, which is basically ground up shell, um, very, very fine. And the shell particles are so fine that for the most part, individual larvae will each set on a particle of shell. So that's what in a hatchery will keep oysters separate. So, um, so when you're at a restaurant getting oysters on the half shell, you have nice individual oysters on a plate uh, as, a as opposed to a big clump of oysters like you would find in nature on, on a reef. Great, thank you. That's, I think that's a good point of distinction. And so commonly, you know, the term sanctuary and oyster reef gets thrown around some, sometimes interchangeably. Um, do you wanna, Mike, uh, I'll, I'll follow up with you. Do you wanna describe the difference between an oyster reef and what someone might describe as an oyster sanctuary? Um, I, at sanctuary, the way, you know, uh, I think the word is commonly used, the way I use it is, is really, uh, it's a protected zone, is a sanctuary. So it's a harvest free area. And when you talk about shellfish sanctuaries, they're areas that have been designated as a, as a harvest free area, uh, with the hope of generating larvae that's going to help populate the rest of the bay. Um, so a sanctuary, like we're building in Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program, we're building hard clams, spawn a sanctuary. So these are harvest-free areas where we're planting lots of hard clams with the, uh, uh, with the Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project. The idea is to build these oyster and clam sanctuaries in these different bays as larval generation zones. Um, when you create the sanctuary, I mean, each, each bivalve's, uh, of course, a little different. Um, but with oysters, you know, they can be free planted on the bottom. So that's one strategy that's used. That's not necessarily building a reef. Um, although over time, it, 
it potentially could form into a reef. Um, you know, whereas when you say reef, you know, you're really talking about a, uh, a congregation of oysters in a, in a three-dimensional structure. In the, in the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program, we're actively building reefs. So we'll set spat on shell in the lab um, onto bags of shell and um, like five gallons of shell in a mesh bag. And then those become actually like cinder blocks. You know, each one of those, those spat on shell bags is a cinder block that we can then go out and build reef structures with the hope that there'll be recruitment to the reef in the future. And, you know, larvae will keep setting on this reef and building it over time. Um, but a, a sanctuary is basically a harvest-free zone that's, that's meant to provide larvae into the system. And uh, whether you build a reef or not in the sanctuary is, um, and when it comes to oysters, uh, um, they could be two separate things, whether you're building a reef or just free planting oysters on the bottom. Gotcha, thank, thank you. Uh, Greg, is there anything that, you know, to kind of continue that topic, is there anything that you'd like to add from your experience of planting both single set oysters and, and uh, spat on shell? Yeah, I mean, one thing I think we all know, but let's go over it anyway, is that they're all the same species. It's really the only species we're allowed to grow in New York State. Uh, Crassostria virginica, Eastern oyster, Atlantic oyster. And it grows from Maine to Gulf of Mexico, Texas, basically the same species. It can look way different depending on where it's grown and how it's grown. As, as Mike said, you know, setting them on a microculture in a hatchery where within days, the oyster is larger than the culch chip, whether that's an eggshell, piece of eggshell, a piece of uh, clam or oyster shell that's ground up and sieved uh, to probably around 200 microns or so, so not even a quarter of a millimeter. Pretty, pretty fine. You know, a little bit bigger than a larva, maybe about the same size as, as a larva would be at time of setting. And then putting the same larvae in, uh, in a tank either at the site remotely, because we can ship these larvae overnight anywhere in the country. We, ha we have shipped them uh, fed FedEx in the past, you know, tens of millions at a time. It's, it's not a big deal. They're fine as long as they're kept moist. But when you set the same larvae on a whole shell, whether that's a clam shell, a surf clam shell, and we talk about shell maybe next time, uh, or an oyster shell, you can get 100 oysters or more set on a shell we try to aim for like about 10 and they'll look quite different. And that's one nice thing about the spat on shell thing. And again, maybe I'm getting too far into it as far as creating the reef and away from the site selection, but they're not as saleable. So now we, we talk about site selection and uh, just really quickly, and I'm glad that Wade is on the call, you know, big time is one of the speakers. Uh, we talk about spat on shell in closed areas, whether seasonally closed or year round closed. I'm not talking prohibited, like in you know a back end of Jamaica Bay or something like that, but year round closures where there is good water quality, maybe a half mile away. So. Gotcha, thank you. Um, and we, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of the, the closed water stuff in, in a little bit as well. Um, but before we get there, um, maybe, um, we could, uh, Wade, I'll direct this to you and Chelsea. Is there anything from DEC's perspective that defines the difference between an oyster reef and an oyster sanctuary? Are there specific constraints where people are interested in, in establishing, you know, when they're in the beginning stages of, we want to do this project and our goal is to create an oyster reef or an oyster sanctuary. Is there any specific rules or limitations that exist that would be pertinent for people to know? Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks, thanks again for the opportunity to be a part of this, uh, this speaker series. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think before jumping into that, it's good to kind of take a, a historical perspective on uh, on shellfish restoration as a loose term in New York. And, uh, you know, Greg Rivara could certainly chime in on this from his experience working with towns and, uh, you know, at C CCE for uh, his career. But I think we're really coming from a place historically of what I would call um, enhancement or, uh, you know, augmentation of, of existing 
shellfish populations or oysters in this case for the purposes of recreational and commercial harvest. Uh, we have several towns here on Long Island that have municipal hatcheries and that was often, um, you know, the, the, their budget, part of their budget and, and what they functioned to do was to produce shellfish to put out into the waters for harvest. So clearly uh, the protection aspect, the sanctuary aspect is, is missing from that equation. And what we've seen here more recently, I'll say in the last uh, maybe five to 10 years is, is more of this idea of um, continuing to do that, that augmentation and enhancement, but in order for it to be more successful and uh, you know, become self-sustaining, we need to create uh, sanctuaries. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a couple of different methods, uh, different groups have, have employed. Um, Mike Dole touched on what SHIRP has done in Shinnecock Bay. Um, there's often two avenues. It's uh, like a, a spat on shell, creating what I'll call a bed versus a, an oyster reef, more of a, a bed, like a veneer layer of that spat on shell in an area that's uh, you know been been chosen because it has uh, you know characteristics that that would be conducive to to both oyster growth and uh, hopefully the retention of of the larvae that are spawned from from those uh, those parent stocks as they as they grow and become reproductive reproductively mature and then. Um, you know, and then more of what I would view as a reef, which is, you know, the introduction of artificial structure, like Mike was describing, to create, uh, you know, to sort of fast track this three-dimensional structure, which could be, you know, uh, a foot, two feet off the bottom, really changing the relief of the bottom and, and changing the existing habitat over to more of a, of a structure. So um, I think those are, are those are two key distinct, distinctions to make. Um, certainly from a regulatory perspective and permitting the latter, the, the uh, you know, placement of, of, of fill or structure into the waterway is, is more of a, uh, you know, has, has a deeper permitting review to it than, than a veneer of spat on shell or creation of a bed, let's say. Gotcha. That, that sounds good. Wait, so let me to just kind of clarify that so everyone's on the same page. The establishing, establishing maybe a three-dimensional structure with spat on shell would potentially require a more thorough or in-depth permitting process than, say, planting loose oyster, um, single-set oysters on the bay bot. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Um with the distinction that if we were talking about closed waters, the limitation would be to, to spat on shell and not the, the single set loose oysters. Gotcha, thank you for clarifying. Um, so we'll move on to kind of talking some general about potential goals and the desired outcomes about these oyster restoration projects before we get into really some of the site specifics. Um, Michael, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll transition over to Thomas and you can talk about his. But so Michael, why don't you give us a brief explanation from your experience of potential goals or desired outcomes you might have with some of these projects? Sure, yeah, I think um, any restoration effort should start off with, with goals, definable goals. And um, that could really impact also, that will directly impact site selection, like what your, what your goal is. Um, you know, I think in general, most restoration projects start off with the goal of restoring an oyster population to a body of, of water, or at least increasing an oyster population to a body of water. Um, and with that being a self-sustaining population, right? So the ultimate goal is to go out there, jumpstart a population, help it and then um, have that build on itself with fu uh, future recruitment every year. So, I mean, I think that's the ult ultimate goal of, of, of most restoration projects, but it's not, you know, with, oyster, with oysters, it's not the only goal. I mean, there may be a goal for, for shoreline stabilization or shoreline protection, um, in which case that's gonna dictate 
if that is your goal, if there's a certain area you want to protect, well, that's going to dictate your 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 site of where you're choosing a site, right? Where you, if you want to protect a certain shoreline, you're going to um, try to choose a site positioning that oyster reef that's going to that's going to meet that goal. Um, you know, other goals. I mean, a really a really important goal is educational purposes and outreach. Um, oyster reefs are um, a very uh, you know, intriguing, a very um, sexy part of nature that people people love. I mean, that's you know, this the speaker series is is testament to that, and um, so it's a great educational tool to connect younger generations with the with the ocean and and to care about the ocean, um, and it's also a great research tool. So, I mean, really, one of one uh, one of our many goals in the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program was creating these reefs, and they've become. Um, experimental platforms for um, uh, graduate students over the last five years. And it's been a lot of great fundamental research done on these reefs. So I think those are all, all different goals, but I think a lot of restoration projects, the ultimate goal is to, is to create and restore a self-sustaining population. Great, thank you. And Thomas, maybe do you wanna build upon that? You can talk about what the goals of uh, Friends of the Bellport Bay, what, what what you guys had envisioned when you when you started with your project? Certainly. Good morning to all. Thank you for hosting. It's a uh, it's an honor to be with this network of community and uh, professionals and experts. Uh, we are a grassroots organization that started uh, soon after Sandy punched a hole through our barrier island system. Um, Belfort Bay, uh, as as most of us know, is at the end of the eastern end of Great South Bay and is could be considered a dead end bay. And our algae blooms prior to Sandy were pretty thick and heavy and uh, the bay bottom looked like a desert. And uh, many of us in Belport and in Belport Mastic uh, East Patrick community um, who use the bay have always talked about doing something to to improve the quality of the bay, but we never knew what that could be. Well, Sandy uh, was a silver lining for us on the Eastern Great South Bay in that it showed us what the bay could look like uh, or what it did look like 100 years ago due to the twice a day flushing that the inlet provided. Suddenly we were able to see uh, our sneakers if we were walking in the bay that, that was six feet down. Uh, the clarity of the bay just improved so dramatically it inspired both me and many others to try to try to lock that new state into, into where it was. So we quickly started talking to people in the community. Um, our, my, one of our, the co-founder of Friends of Belport Bay is Katia Reed. She had planted oysters with Isabella Rossellini and the Post Morrow Foundation years earlier near Ridge Island. Um, but uh, those efforts failed because the ice came in and took away all the plantings. So we had a little knowledge about, uh, or a little inspiration from people in our community that attempted to do this earlier years before Sandy. So fast forward, today we have planted approximately 2 million shellfish in Bellport Bay. Um, Marshall Brown uh, dubbed our efforts, or Friends of Bellport Bay, as the lungs of the Great South Bay, in that we were the, one of the first to plant oysters freely on, on, the, on the bay bottom in a sanctuary which the town provided. Now, I just have to say right here that we can't do this by ourselves as a group of community members. It involves a tremendous amount of coordination between the town. The town is one of the most important partners in, in this restoration or habitat restoration project that we're doing. And it's true with all towns because it's the town controls the Bay Bottom. Um, Supervisor Ed Romain is a tremendous partner in our efforts to, to recreate habitat in Belfort Bay. He has, he and his board has has a, have allowed us to um, uh, take two acre parcel where we now plant our shellfish. We plant oysters, spat on shell, scallops, clams. We're, we're looking to restore the habitat, not just lay oysters or shellfish onto the bay bottom. And what's really appealing is we're very proud of our monitoring program. Greg, Greg Rivara is our leader. He's, our, he's a hired hand. He comes in to make sure that we are crossing our T's and dotting our I's. And he also dives down onto our sanctuary twice a year to see how things are going. And part of that process is to randomly pull up um, samples of shellfish to count, measure. And uh, the most recent uh, unscientific study was that our survival rate 
of oysters on the bay bottom was approximately 70%. And that's interesting because one of our board members suggested that we weren't doing too well because our survival rate was only 70%. Why are we losing 30% of our oysters? And mostly to a blue crab predation. Um, and the answer to that is if we didn't have loss, that would be odd and strange and worrisome. Uh, having loss, natural loss like that is, is a common natural process. And each oyster loss is a shell where spat or spawn can settle on. So we don't see any loss as a detriment, but more as a positive effect of the ecosystem. But um, choosing a site, Bellport Bay is one of the only South Shore estuaries along um, the Great South Bay that has a shoreline that is not closed to shellfish harvesting. From uh, North Howells Point to the Bellport Dock is still considered uh, an open free area. So we have the opportunity to put cages under docks as part of the um, license to collect and possess permit that we filed with the DEC. We have about 30 cages under private docks where we grow out um, oysters that we purchase from uh, the nurseries. We also have a Flupsy on the Beaver Dam Creek, which is also permitted by the DEC where we grow out oysters from two millimeter. Our goal is to uh, grow oysters to 45 millimeter. Once we get them to an inch and a half or so, we then lay them on our bed. We are also currently applying for a hard reef to be built in our sanctuary and we're in uh, that application process with the DEC. And I must say, Wade, I know you're here and we just wanna say thank you, Wade, and your entire office for, for always holding our hand as we go through this permit process. Another great partner in this restoration um, process is the New York State DEC and they are just spectacular at supporting our dreams, our initiatives and helping us move our applications forward in a very, expeditious way. Thank you, Thomas. What a great summary. And, you know, it sounds, you know, your sanctuary is more than just a single sanctuary for, for oysters, but you, you're actually, like you said, trying to do a complete restorative picture with multiple species. Um, and right. that you're in that nice area where you are not um, uncertified, you know, in this uncertification of waters. Um, which I think brings us to a good transition. And for those of you that aren't aware, um, in Long Island, there are certain bodies of water that are designated as um, seasonal for shellfish harvest or they're year round closed for harvest or they're open and considered certified waters. Um, so that is an important distinction to make when we're thinking about site selections. Um, first, I think we'll, we'll bring in Greg on this and Greg, if you don't mind explaining whether or not um, can a site be in a seasonal or a year-round closure area, and then for sure we'll follow up with um, Wade and DEC to get um, their uh, their thoughts on that as well. Well, to be honest, I I checked in with Wade last week, <laughs> uh, knowing this was going to come up, and I I didn't even know he was on the panel at the time. And I'm glad he is, obviously, and Chelsea. But I had to ask him point blank, at least in region one, which is pretty much uh, Nassau Suffolk in DEC parlance, uh, that question. And the answer is yes, as long as you do spat on shell and Wade brought that up, I think earlier and not singles. And you might say, well, it's the same species, the spat on shell are edible, they grow. I mean, some of them get to be, you know, five, six inches long at least, but they're kind of gnarly. They look more like rabbit ears, some of them. and you're unlikely gonna sell them to a restaurant. So there's still a poaching hazard. Uh, it's probably more going to be people that are hungry uh, or just want, want oysters and don't realize what they're doing. So the answer is yes. And uh, really quickly, me and other partners, including uh, Pete Malinowski, who's gonna be here next Friday, I, I heard, uh, we did a big project in Jamaica Bay, which is region two. And well, it was in Hempstead Town, which is, I guess, still region one. But anyway, it was with New York City. And it was right in the shadow of JFK, the large airport. And that's been closed for over 100 years. So, so the DEC, both region one and two, allowed that to go on. And it was, there are some singles that were on the site. But 
there's so much uh, monitoring and enforcement there because of the airport. I mean, we had to call the Port Authority every time we took a boat there because the planes were like so close and uh, you don't want people in small boats near the airport if you don't know who they are. So anyway, that's that's what I, what I got to say about it. I think Wade could, knows a lot more than I do about it. Yeah, and that's, that's a good follow up. Um, Wade and Chelsea, do you mind weighing in and, and offering DEC's perspective, you know, kind of a, a clear distinction on what can be allowed in a seasonal and if anything can be allowed in a, a year round closed area? Uh, sure. So um, just to just to mention to everyone, uh, if you go on DEC's website, you can do a, a search for our public shellfish mapper. It's an interactive mapper that will allow you to, um, you know, cruise all over the island and see the various closures and you can uh, click on areas and, and see in the case of, say, a seasonal closure, what, um, you know, what the dates of that closure are. So, and just to give some background on this, um, all shellfish producing states where commercial harvest of uh, shellfish is occurring and, and, and those seafood products are gonna go into uh, inter or interstate commerce, um, we all have to uh, conform to the, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration's um, National Shellfish Sanitation Program. So all of the states, the coastal states that are shellfish producers are our programs, whoever the authority over, um, you know, shellfish resources is and in New York, obviously it's DEC. Um, we have to conform with that national program. And part of that national program is uh, classifying all of the, the tidal water areas that uh, where shellfish resources could be found. So uh different states use different different may use different terminology for for that classification in, in new york yes uh we'll, we'll start with certified certified means that dec's artificial classification unit has maintained a a database of, of water quality data sampling sampling those water bodies and, and those for example to the laboratory and uh, Assessing them for fecal cold form bacteria, and they meet they meet the national program standard for being approved for shellfish harvest. Next after that, you have we, we have seasonal areas which are closed for much of the year, typically during the summer months uh, or or late spring to early fall, because those are the times of years where uh, the time of the year where uh, water quality is in, impaired. So. Um, again, those areas are, are sampled, and when an analysis is done, it's, we see that it meets the standard during, during the winter months, doesn't meet it during the summer. And then finally, you have the year-round uncertified, um, which, which means that it could mean two things. It could mean, one, that we have the data for uh, fecal coliform bacteria and it does not meet the national standard for, um, you know, being approved for shellfish harvest, or it's we we don't have any data to classify it. So um, that's a that's a breakdown of the the classification scheme of water bodies for shellfish harvest in New York. As far as uh, as shellfish restoration, um, yeah. So as of as of right now, we Again, we haven't had too many projects that that meet that what we're talking about is a sanctuary distinction, meaning that they've been recognized as as uh, a protected area. Um, and I understand that the uncertified areas are attractive because they they afford that um, you know that that protection because they they have this regulatory. Uh, you know, regulatory aspect of being off limits. So, but we still have to, uh, you know, we're we're mandated to protect public health as far as uh, shellfish harvest goes. Oysters, obviously, are um, especially in our area are, are typically it's a it's a raw half shell market, 
So, and we, we're unable to just make a distinction between, oh, well, uh, you know, clustered oysters don't have to be regulated like, uh, you know, a, a perfectly beautiful aquaculture single set oyster. So, um, so yeah, in New York right now, we are, we are considering spat on shell oyster restoration in, in closed waters, although uh, I say that with a caveat that it's a it's it's on a case by case basis. Every site is different, and and so every uh, permit review for any given restoration project is different. Thank you, Wade. Good explanation, and you know just to sum up, so so everyone understands the the role that DEC plays is these rules are there to protect the public from potentially getting sick by consuming shellfish that was taken out of areas that are considered closed. So even though at times people may get frustrated because they want to try to do something that they think is doing the right thing, but DEC doesn't permit it, it you know, we can't, you know, Wade and everyone in his department works really hard with all of our organizations to be trying to facilitate things. It is good news that, um, you know, you're considering the idea of possibly putting spat on shell in closed areas um, and understanding that it is a case by case basis. Anything that's new and evolving from existing protocols requires a little more diligence. Um, if I could interject and just make sure everyone keeps their microphones on mute, please. Um, thank you. Um, so, with that transition, so now we kind of understand where our water body options are for um, where sanctuaries can be. Um, Greg, what would be some of the early distinctions that someone would want to look at for a site selection? Um, how deep should the site be? And what, what type of water um, uh, bay bottom would you recommend um, being used for a selection site? So in any given embayment, and this goes back to what, what Michael said earlier, if you want to try to get a self-sustaining reef, which is kind of the holy grail, you don't want to get away from outlets of an estuary. So you don't want to be like by an inlet, uh, even though that's that could be really great water, uh, water quality uh, with some of the South Shore bays with the ocean coming in. But a lot of the larvae could wind up in the ocean and lost to the, the system forever. The other issue would be the proximity to a landing. You're going to have small boats. Do uh, you need a boat ramp? Can you get a truck to the a road end and work from a vehicle like we did in uh, East Mauritius with the town of Brookhaven and the Mauritius Bay Project? And as far as the bottom type, the harder the better. If we could use uh, our expensive, hard to get, scarce uh, shell to really provide the spat on shell, the living part of the reef, instead of using it as a base material, so much the better. Uh, and we don't want what's called subsidence where our reef or our bed is slowly sinking into the sediment, which would happen with softer sediments. So uh, the harder the better, the further from the, uh, the inlet outlet, the better. And again, uh, trying to mobilize and demobilize equipment. How, how you don't want to be in the middle of nowhere necessarily. And also that, that also makes uh, sense for keeping an eye on things. The one we did in East Marich is, is at a road end. We never had a boat there. It wasn't that far out. And we have a neighbor who is like a watchdog and she's great. Uh, she actually called both the environmental conservation police at DEC and the town of Brookhaven uh, Bay constables on a bunch of guys that were coming from a restaurant. And this area is open to shell fishing, by the way. So people are used to going there. We have only sign we have up there is a permit, which is a whole other thing we could talk about as signage. But in any case, uh, and as far as depth goes, I would say something that's probably deeper than four feet at low tide in terms of wave action. And look at your fetches, southwest in the summer, northwest in the winter. How far is the fetch? In other words, how far are the waves going to be building before they? literally hit your reef. And we found out in Jamaica Bay during Hurricane Sandy that our, our three-dimensional beautiful reef with fish spawning on it, we have videos, was gone. It was just flattened. We didn't barely found anything. 
So sometimes deeper is better. And if you're going to be trying to do erosion control or storm surge protection, you got to go big. You got to go concrete or rebar. You can't just put like what we did, some spat on shell bags out. They just got destroyed. Gotcha, gotcha. Some some very important things to distinct, and and I, I think the fetch is the big one. Um, uh, Tom, do you want to maybe kind of build on that and talk about what the um, the depth and the bottom of your sanctuary is, since you've been doing that for a few years, and and that sounds like it's been very successful and productive. So maybe that's a good example. Certainly, thank you. So we have two parts of our operation. We are growing out oysters from, um, from seed. And once that those oysters are a certain size, we put them into our sanctuary. So growing out oysters, we don't have the heavy equipment or the hoist on boats. We don't have a fleet of, uh, of boats to, to tend to growing out oysters. So it's imperative that we have the ability to grow out oysters in certified waters that we could wade out into. It's, 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 uh, it's extremely important to be able to access your growing systems. So choosing a location to grow out oysters, number one, you have to be in certified waters if you're growing out singles, as we, as we know. And you have to be in, I believe, water that you could wade in, whether you, get, you take a boat to that location in the flats on the south side of our bay, or in our case, we are growing out oysters on, in cages under dock. So we could simply... Uh, wade into these areas to tend to our cages. Uh, our sanctuary is located in approximately seven feet of water. Um, uh, maybe the low tide is about four feet, and that's where we're planting the singles. We're also planting spat on shell, and we're also uh, applying to build a hard reef within that sanctuary. And um, we're also able to access that sanctuary from the shoreline because it's close to the northern side of the bay. So having access to your sanctuary and to your, to your um, quote unquote farms that you're using to, to, to build your sanctuaries and, and um, beds would have to be easily accessible. I also wanna bring up this point, the footprint you have on the bay is not as large as a footprint you need on land. Um, so we have an area at a local marina that we rent where we could store our bags, our cages, our, our, our flupsy in the wintertime. So logistically speaking, one would need to have a location on land. Uh, in the early years, we were um, putting all our equipment at all the volunteers' homes and the board members' homes. And then we were wasting time collecting all this equipment from location to location. So finally, we were able to secure a common space on land on the bay where we could easily move cages back and forth and bags back and forth. Um, so that's also important when, you, when you're choosing a site. Thank you, thank you. That, that's also a very good point. Yeah, logistically, when you are using the equipment and you're raising the animals that you're putting in your sanctuary, you, you do need to have a place to store everything. I, I find that to be a, a common theme amongst aquaculture and hatchery related programs. Storage space is always a hot commodity. Um, one thing, I'm going to direct this question to Michael. Um, well, what's the difference between a recruitment limited and a substrate limited area? Um, and, and why do you think this is important to evaluate um, during that site selection process? Sure. Um, so recruitment, that refers to uh, the setting of the next generation, right? So, so recruitment refers to... Uh, uh, the addition of new young to a population. And um, in some areas, and within, on Long Island even, um, there are areas where we have natural oyster recruitment, particularly on the, on the, um, on the North Shore and a lot of the bays we have, uh, there are natural sets and oyster recruitment. Whereas in the South Shore, um, uh, it, it, with the exception of some places like Meacox Bay, throughout most of the South Shore estuary, there's you would call the South Shore Estuary a, a very recruitment limited system. There's not too much oyster recruitment um, in the South Shore Estuary. And a substrate limited, limited system is just as it says, um, you know, areas, especially developed areas where a lot of the natural substrate, um, you know, whether, the, whether um, uh, uh, the existing reefs are gone, they've been gone for hundreds of years, but there's areas that are substrate limited. And, um, 
I've been following some areas on the North Shore over the last few years um, that have heavy oyster sets. And, um, and you'll see in these areas, they are starved for substrate in a lot of, in a lot of these areas. Um, you know, uh, common things that will be used for substrate um, in the, uh, you know, within the intertidal, if you find a, a rock, um, uh, rib mussels actually make a great substrate. You find a lot of oysters sometimes set on top of, on top of rib mussels. Um, I've even seen them set on sticks in the mud. So any hard substrate that's needed. And I think that's an important, um, it would be an important part of, of selecting a site. It's also a very important consideration just in your strategy of how you're going to restore the reef. And I know that's, I think, next week's topic. So I, I won't touch on that too much. But if you're able to select an area that has natural recruitment, it can make your restoration efforts a lot easier um, because you may have to then um, really focus more on just adding the substrate, okay, and creating that substrate and letting nature take its course as opposed to a recruitment limited area like in the South Shore, where not only do you need to provide the substrate, you need to provide the source population. You need to help boost the recruitment. So it's a much, much, um, a much, much greater challenge, a much, much greater task to try to uh, restore a self-sustaining population where there, where there isn't one or, that, or it's very, you know, very little. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, that, that is something to consider through the whole process of planning a restoration project is what is the natural recruitment in the area and what is this and what is the substrate available in the area um and um you know i think related which uh, i think is maybe a good time um to bring up you know is the i is the idea of oysters as a a meta population is the term and a, a meta population is a um is a population um, it's a series of interconnected separate populations and the terms used for all sorts of things on nature on land too. There's lots of populations where there's separate subpopulations that are connected through migration. Uh, but in, when you talk about oysters, oyster populations, you know, oysters are sedentary. So reefs will set up in different areas, maybe different creeks, maybe, um, uh, different bays throughout the South shore estuary. And, um, uh, uh, when they reproduce and larvae are produced, larvae are transported between reefs. So that's the connection. The larval stage is the connection between reefs and this oyster metapopulation. So in placing reefs, something to really think about is um, larval transport and recruitment. And so if you're putting a reef in an area, well, is there any natural recruitment in this area? Um, is there going to, is something going to feed this reef moving? And, at, and, uh, conversely, you also want to know if I'm putting a reef in this area, where are the larvae going to go? You know, and Greg, Greg touched on that before. You might not want to put, even though the water quality is great, you might not want to put a reef right at the, um, you know, right at the, uh, inlet to Bellport Bay, because a lot of that larvae will just get swept out into the Atlantic ocean. Um, and, uh, so understanding the recruitment um is a uh you know it's definitely an important part of site selection great thank you thank you uh, greg would you like to build upon this yeah i just wanted to say two things related to what i said earlier and one was the depth of water i said four feet minimum at low tide it depends on the site the big problem we have here and we did this with the friends of bellport bay we planted kind of intertidally at one point by those islands and it was doing great. And then we had something called ice, which, you know, we have ocean warming, but we still have winters where we're going to have ice. And ice is going to either move the oysters or kill them in situ. And that's what we had in, in, uh, in the southern part of Billport Bay. And our first thought it was a disease. We went there in March, I don't know, Tom, five years ago, whenever that was. It was really like, oh, my God, what happened? Everybody was bummed out. And I couldn't believe that 90-something percent of these oysters died over a few months uh, with a disease. And then I saw some hard clams that were, again, this is March, not a lot of bio biological activity, but hard clams that were out of the sediment like that, you know, cluckers, clean inside, no shell chips, no, no uh, predator marks on them. And they got frozen in the sediment. That's how cold it took one night of like single digits at low tide with a clear night 
to, to kill quite a few animals there. So that's why we can't do it like they do in South Carolina where you've got beaches at low tide. It's like razor blades sticking up. It's incredible. The other thing that no one's talked about yet, and it's actually Jermaine and Tom, Tom Schultz pointed this out you know, months ago to me, is freshwater inputs. Uh, most of the sites I've worked in and most of Long Island really, we're not like Connecticut. We don't have a lot of rivers and streams coming into our embayments. Obviously, Peconic River and Carmen's River on the south side, but there are some of these small outlets from you know, Montauk to the city that are bringing in uh, fresh water. And that can do two things. It can keep predators away. A lot of uh, sea stars, drills, crabs, some crabs don't like lower salinities. And as importantly, it could also keep diseases at bay. Uh, we know that uh, the protozoan parasites, these oyster diseases, not human <laughs> diseases, but these oyster diseases don't do well in, in lower salinities. And I, I'm kind of cheating by going and looking at the chat earlier about a salinity range, someone asked, and the literature is like 10 to 28 parts per thousand is a good range. Uh, where I am at the Marine Center in this, this uh, 30 year old hatchery, we've got 28 parts per thousand almost year round. We're on a big sandbar, actually all of Long Island's a big sandbar really, right? We don't have a lot of salinity changes, uh, but in that lower end of the range, in like 10 to 15, you get, get some real benefits. You can have slower growth, but you're gonna have benefits in terms of predation and diseases. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Yes, yeah, the, the salinity was was definitely part of the, the next topic uh, or next question. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, and you, you talked a little bit about predators. Um, do you wanna just build on that about what, what are common predators that you're observing? Um, and if you know there are ways to work around that or kind of hard to avoid them, but maybe you could just kind of talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, real quick. I mean, predators are, they suck. <laughs> our biggest, uh, one of our biggest issues way bigger than say dermo disease, which will kill an oyster in, th in three years or so. But at least the oyster could spawn a few times before they're eaten, I mean, I'm sorry, killed by a disease. Uh, Jamaica Bay, uh, back in, again, 12 years ago, we worked with the city on a smaller project. This is the one that got, one of them that got destroyed in Sandy off of, in, on the Rockaway Peninsula, or uh, Dubose Point, also close to JFK, not as close as what we did a few years ago, a much larger project. But it was going great. We put the stuff out in October of uh, 2010, I want to say. It was growing great. Again, videos. This is a half meter high, about foot and a half high uh, reef on a big bed of uh, surf clam shell that we trucked in. And we had help from Miller Marine and uh, again, the, the city and a whole bunch of other partners. And then all of a sudden, we saw a lot of oyster drills on our site. Where did they come from? Oysters have been functionally extinct in Jamaica Bay for you know, decades, 100 years, at least 75 years. Uh, and so going back to what, what Mike said, it's uh, both larval limited and substrate limited, that bay. There are no larvae, et cetera. So we put spat on shell out and we put reef balls out in Brooklyn that actually survived uh, Sandy because they were in a deeper water and they were in, uh, in a protected embayment. But these drills I found out later came from pilings that were nearby the site, old pilings just randomly sticking up, all gribbled and eaten up because there were uh, barnacles and rib mussels on those pilings. And drills will eat anything. They're called oyster drills, but they eat anything, you know, and they're predators. They don't prey. They're not like some snails that'll eat a, a dead animal. They're predators. They want live food. And, you know, try it. Put some oyster drills in an aquarium, put a live oyster in a, and smash an oyster or a mussel, and generally they'll go to the live oyster because they're sensing that X current from the X current uh, material, basically CO2 and waste materials that the oysters are putting out. They're sensing that, uh, that X current or in a clam would be a siphon, but oysters don't have siphons. So they came from an area we didn't expect it. And it really, we picked hundreds of these things off in a three-dimensional reef. Everyone we picked, it had to be 10 more probably we couldn't even see without going through and destroying what we were trying to build this, you know, this reef assemblage. So predators are tough. Can you uh, pot them? Yeah, you can pot crabs, you can even pot drills. There are ways people have been dealing with drills for literally hundred years. 
There's a lot of great literature, old great literature that you might not find on the web. I've got some in my office actually, where they put these chicken wire bags of young oysters down because young oysters per a gram of tissue mass are gonna have a higher metabolic rate than an older oyster. So you create this uh, pillow and it could be a couple of feet square of young oysters. You could put muscles into uh, something that's got a high metabolic rate. The drills will get attracted to that. You gently lift it off the bottom on a trot line and you bring them into the boat and you shake the heck out of it, shaking all of the drills out of the chicken wire mesh. Could be Vexar now. It was back then, there were no plastics. I'm talking about 1920s. Uh, and hopefully they didn't eat much of your bait. So the bait lives, it's growing. And these could be runted oysters or just sacrificial oysters. You put that, that uh, bait bag back down for another few days, let it soak. So you're trying to get, and this could be in the perimeter of your reef. So you're trying to get these drills before they get on the reef. And we did not do that in Jamaica Bay. So I don't know if that answers the question. These crabs are a big deal, big deal. Thank you, Greg. That, that, I, that's a very interesting, you know, trick there with the, uh, you know, using them as bait to haul them up. Um, you know, I think that might be worth trying at some, some places. Um, Tom, do you want to, you know, build on that? What, what are you guys seeing at your site regarding predators? Do you see um, an influx of, of sea stars or whelks or anything like that? What, what are you finding as far as predators? And Greg could, uh, Greg could talk to this uh, uh, more scientifically, but it's my impression from all our observations and um, um, dives onto our sanctuary that the number one predator within our sanctuary, our plantings, is the, is the crab. Um, we very rarely see any, any other predation. Uh, Greg, would, would you concur with that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different crabs, Thomas, and blue yep. claws is probably the, the, the biggest one in size, but mud crabs and green crabs are probably more numerous and can do damage, especially to the smaller animals, or spat on shell as they're growing. The nice thing about spat on shell, which again, we could talk about in another one of these series, but really quickly is that the, you can put the animals out at a much smaller size than you could singles. If you put a three millimeter oyster out single that was set on a microculch, it's like a potato chip. It's gone. It's going to fall, go into the sediment. It's going to get chewed up really quick by anything. Blowfish, porgy, crabs. But the same size animal on a shell, it's growing kind of parallel to the shell. And it's a lot harder for a crab to get its, uh, its claw under there and eat that, th that thing. So, And we did find a few oyster drills on, on the site last time, back in the fall. Nothing like we had in Jamaica Bay, but I hate those things. <laughs> they're, they're bad. They have very few predators. They'll eat them, set, each other. They're cannibalistic somewhat. But getting rid of the egg cases, which we can talk about as well, as well as the adults, is really, is really going to be critical, I think, to a lot of these projects. And commercial oyster farmers, I don't know if, if uh, Mike Dole found this in, in Lake Montauk, but it's a big bugaboo for commercial oyster farmers, especially in some cages where it's just like... Uh, all that, all that biological activity is bringing drills from literally miles away. They'll, they'll find you if you don't have them when you start the farm. I would add that the, uh, we're fearful, we're most fearful of the number one predator to the oyster, and that is man. I don't, I don't eat oysters, but my wife makes up for that. Uh, we, of course, we don't consume the oysters that we plant. We're not allowed to. Um, but where we're most fearful of um, man raiding our sanctuary and they could wipe out the total population overnight if they're organized. And I know the Merchers Bay project did experience that type of predation. Um, but I do wanna go back to salinity. Uh, where our sanctuary is located on the north side of Belport Bay opposite uh, a natural water feature, which brings fresh water into the sanctuary. It's also, um, and so we, we measure our growth rate throughout the season. We bring the, the kids in through our educational seminars and we open up the cages and we measure how the oysters are doing. And we're at the point now where we're comparing and contrasting the growth rate of oysters that are grown in less salinity levels, uh, lower salinity levels versus uh, oysters that are grown uh, nearer the inlet where the salinity levels have approached 32 parts per million. Uh, the inlet is slowly closing up, so the salinity levels in Belport Bay are beginning to recede back to their pre-sandy condition. But I also want to talk about um, recruitment. We are so excited um, when we when we 
uh, observe natural recruitment within our systems. Most of the recruitment that we do see, and it's very rare, uh, are usually um, uh, spawn setting up within our cage systems or on the bags or the bulkheads that our cages are, are, are tied to. So we are seeing recruitment, but the, the flow of Bellport Bay is such that the water flows into Bellport Bay counterclockwise and then exits Bellport Bay on the north side of the bay and floods Patrogue Bay, if you will. So we, we recognize that any spawning that is taking place within our sanctuary, that that's that 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 spawn or the, the, those that 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 movement of water is moving that spawn into the greater Great South Bay. So it is our hope that uh, reefs will be set up all along the Great South Bay east west of Bellport Bay to be able to catch the spawn that our sanctuary is is giving out. Uh, and one other note with um, your first question, Michael, was what has inspired you, or what is what is what is your, your what is your uh, in indicator? What is your goal? And Supervisor Ed Romain of Brookhaven Town suggested that it would take thirty million single oysters to filter the volume of Bellport Bay in a twenty-four hour period. And that may or may not be true, but it's a number that has 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 resonated with us. And um, Ken Daly of the Gino Macchio Foundation, who's been a spectacular partner, also recognizes that in order to restore the habitat of Great South Bay, we have to get to a critical mass. We have to get to the, the largest number of oysters that we can get onto the bay bottom. And um, that critical mass number, whatever that is, 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 is kind of like the number that I see in my mind every day when we do our plantings. And the more oysters and shellfish on the bay bottom, the closer we will get to that critical mass where if we do get the next algae bloom, the oysters will consume that algae and maybe mitigate it to the point where it's not depleting the water column of oxygen. So it's about getting as many oysters on the bay bottom in as quickly as possible. That's how I see our mission. Thank you, Tom, that's great. That's a great bit of information and, and I, I love the enthusiasm and that, that's, I think, you know, it, sometimes it is helpful being able to throw a number out there because it, it gives, you can kind of put a target there, you know, um, gives you something tangible to be striving for. Um, Michael, do you want to, is there anything about um, predators that you want to build upon, you know, Greg had talked about his experiences in Jamaica Bay and Thomas in, in the Bellport Bay. You know you've you've done work all over the island, North Shore, East End. Um, is there any uh, things you want to just kind of add on about predators and, and potential um, issues that you've dealt with? Yeah, you know, I think uh, uh, a couple of things to tie a couple of things together: predators, salinity, water depth, and and. Uh, yeah, and location and site evaluation. Um, you know, start off, you know, if you look um, where oysters are abundant down south, um, you know, whether you're, you know, what, Florida or the Carolinas or uh, in the Gulf, but if you look at where, or Chesapeake Bay, if you look at where um, oysters exist, where the reefs are, where the oyster beds are, Usually you're finding oysters more in the tributaries, not the, like if you look at the Chesapeake Bay, all the little tiny tributaries, creeks, you'll find the oysters, the main stem of the Chesapeake will have less. And also most of those, most of the oysters are, are intertidal. Um, so there's a lot, um, and you might ask why, why are the oysters intertidal um, in so many places? And, you know, a couple of reasons tying together in these tributaries, creeks, you do have that freshwater input. So as Greg had mentioned, those lower salinities, um, can reduce disease, particularly dermo, and um, also can change the predator regime. So you have a, a, a bit of a salinity, you have a bit, bit of refuge from disease in these lower salinity areas. And then the intertidal also provides a, a refuge from a lot of predators. Um, you know, when you're exposed um, to the air and you're out of water, it's stressful for any marine organism, even, even an oyster. So an oyster will grow better when it's underwater. If it's protected from predators, an oyster will grow better if it's subtidal all the time and underwater because it can always always feed. Where it's intertidal, you don't eat for a while and you got to close down. It's stressful, but oysters can handle that stress much better than most of the predators. So, um, so the intertidal is where oyster where survivorship is often higher, lower disease, lower predation. Um, the problem is up here, 
is you have uh, winters like we've, you know, like we just had over the last couple of weeks. So you'll have these events, um, uh, these, these freezing events and, and ice um, that really kind of restricts our, our uh, you know, our abilities in the intertidal. Um, you know, however, if you look around and where there's natural sets on Long Island um, on the North Shore, most of them are in the very, the lowest part of the intertidal. So you might only see them at extreme low tides. Um, you know, and I think there's a little trade-off there that, you know, you have all those advantages of being in the intertidal, but, um, uh, you know, you have, you have freezing temperatures in the winter. So that low, you know, the lowest part of the, uh, of the intertidal maybe gives you a little bit more refuge from the, from the cold weather. Um, you know, following some of these populations uh, on the North Shore, you know, there really hasn't been until the, until the last few weeks, there hasn't been a cold winter for three years. I mean, the really, the worst winter, maybe Greg, this is the one you were referring to, I think it was uh, from the end of 2017 into 2018, we had 13 days below freezing. I think that was like a record setting uh, winter. Um, and also as a side, one of the first reefs we built at the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program, which was partly intertidal, the intertidal part had 90% mortality on it from the ice, whereas the subtidal part um, had much better survivorship. So, so um, you can see the impacts that ice have, but you know, without, without a really cold winter for the last three years, the oysters in a lot of these natural sets, there's multiple generations. So there's, there's, you can see, find oysters one, two, three years old. Um, very curious to go see what's happened over the last few weeks at some of these places. I mean, they, they could be gone and that could just be the nature of, of, um, of, of oyster populations on Long Island. You know, um, you'll have these winters or you'll have storm events. Like Greg had also mentioned hurricanes, you know, I mean, that happens down South too. And you'll wipe out, you'll, you'll completely wipe out reefs and beds of oysters from, from hurricanes, um, anywhere. Um, uh, but when you have a, robo a robust enough population in many different locations, that can help uh, at least leave enough source populations after these events to um, uh, to help rebuild the population. Um, yeah. So as far as you know, as far as predators go, the intertidal is a refuge from from predators, um, and uh, you know, and again, it's a trade off with with um, concerns about ice and and um, and storm activity. Um, and then very specifically, you know, with the, with the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program, um, very similar to, I think, what Thomas said in, in Bellport, um, uh, we don't really have much in the way of oyster drills. Uh, we haven't. Um, they're there, but it hasn't been a problem. Um, crabs are a, probably the major predator when the oysters are small, uh, but as oysters get larger, they, they, they uh, um, become too big for the predators eat. So there's a certain size threshold that's a, that's a predator refuge for oysters as they grow. So the crab predation is really on the, on the, uh, on the smaller spat. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, but besides that, we haven't seen much in the way of predators. What's sometimes more of a problem is fouling organisms. Um, so boring sponges um, that will over time degrade the shell and, and, and kill the oyster. Um, so some of these fouling oysters we're finding to be a little bit uh, fouling organisms, a, a bit more of a, of a problem than, than predators. And I think because I'll end there. I just want to add something real quick, Barry, to, to what Mike said. At low tide, uh, intertidal oyster reefs, you know, crabs aren't going to want to be there. Fish aren't going to be there, obviously. But there is one predator that can get at them. And I'm talking about uh, not diving birds, but like seagulls, flying birds. They can get in there at low tide and grab oysters Generally not if they're spat on shell, big clumps, or if they're really small singles, they can get those and drop them. We've all seen dropped on parking lots and the roof of your house or whatever, your car. So that is one thing, Gulls, but I agree with you that there is a predator refuge at, at low tide to a lot of these uh, immersed predators like fish and drills. Although drills actually, I've seen drills exposed for hours and hours at low tide and they'll continue to feed, unfortunately, on your oysters. They don't care about a little desiccation. They're really tough to kill with brine dips and that kind of thing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. The oyster drills are, are very resilient and the bane of most people's aquaculture existence. The, uh, the seagull thing is, is certainly funny. And, and yeah, you, you can always see that around uh, parking lots and such. Someone in the chat had mentioned about um, actually seeing diving ducks um, that are consuming um, the 
some of the oyster. Now, obviously, with a lot of these predators, there is a size threshold, um, which, you know, if you're able to put animals out at inch and a half, or like you talked about on the spat on shell, it does create a little bit of, uh, it, it makes it more challenging for predators to get at them. Um, have Greg, have you ever encountered issues with, with, with diving ducks? I mean, I think the person in the chat, they had mentioned that it, it looked like um, they're finding them in their gizzards, but I, I don't know if you've ever seen them, you know, on your, on any of the reefs that you've set up, Greg? No, I, I've seen it more with clams, basically in, in fauna than oysters. Uh, and diving ducks are a big deal to uh, mussel farmers up in Maine and Atlantic Canada. They'll strip a line and a lot of these guys have predator nets, like a salmon farm would have to keep seals away from, from their salmon. They'd have these predator nets around mussel rafts. Uh, so diving ducks should not be a big issue, especially with spat on shell. They're not going to chomp on a oyster that's growing on a, they want to grab something small, like a little gem, gem a clam or a small hard clam or a, a, so, a softer steamer clam. Uh, will they eat oysters? Yeah, they will, but it's not, I wouldn't worry about the diving ducks as much as uh, other predators at this point. Thank you. Um, so we've kind of, we've talked about a lot of different specifics, you know, water depth, bottom type, recruitment, water flow, um, working around predators as best as possible. Is there, um, when it comes to site selection, how much have you looked at historic beds um, for, for looking at site selection? I mean, I, it may not be that easy to find some of this information, but maybe, maybe we'll start with Mike. Um, have you used any of the historic data about um, oyster, old oyster reef beds as some of your locations at all? Um. That really has not been a deciding factor on actually specific sites of, of choosing a location, although it is something we investigate and, um, you know, it, it, you know, it is important to know where a voice has been in the past, you know, but, um, um, and I, I think, as you said, too, some of that information is something, especially on Long Island Bay, sometimes the the um, the history gets a gets a little foggy of what was natural oyster reefs and what was um, uh, you know imported or transported between locations. There was even you know going back hundreds of years. There's been a lot of moving oysters around, um, and um, um, you know I think I saw. I don't know if he's still on the on the on the uh, on the meeting. I, I think I saw Jeff uh, uh, Kasner's name up there, but he's been a historian of of. Uh, of um, uh, shellfish on on Long Island, and particularly the South Shore, and so he's written some great stuff about the history and um, um, even the you know even the famous you know probably the world's most famous Blue Point oyster. Part of that history is, is that was seed that was brought up from um, down south in the 1800s and planted off of Blue Point, not necessarily a natural population. So. Um, uh, yeah, so the history gets a little foggy. It's actually, what was a natural population and what wasn't? If you go back much further in time, you know, I know, uh, I believe, um, I believe it's Roger Flood at, uh, at SOMAS, at Stony Brook University, you know, has done a whole bunch of different side scan sonar mapping and has found um, historic, you know, remnants of historic oyster reefs throughout, the, throughout Long Island Bays. And to be honest with you, I don't remember the exact how long ago that was, time scale. You know, we're talking... I know we're talking hundreds of years ago. Um, you know, most natural any nat most natural oyster reefs on Long Island were pretty much um, you know harvested out um, you know, long before we were born. So in the 1800s. Um, so the the history of where actually these reefs were. Uh, I always love to talk to some of um, you know some of the old timers out on the water fishing um, from when they were kids. Where did they find oysters? Where you know where you know um, to get a little bit of the history that way, but it's definitely a, it's definitely when you combine the transport of oyster seed throughout throughout bays throughout between states um, and history, the history gets a, gets a little muddled. But I can't say, oh, we're putting you know like at least for the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program, um, we didn't place a reef because we knew that there was an existing reef there a couple hundred years ago. That really had nothing to do with the placement of, of the reef, but the uh, uh, but the history is very important and also very interesting. I love the history. 
Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It, and like I, I kind of figured, you know, like you said, the oyster reefs were long gone before many of us were on, but, but it is interesting with the getting the historical information and being able to add that. Um, and it's also possible that a, a lot of things have changed between water flow dynamics and stuff between um, now and then. Um, so I think at this point, we're going to open it up to questions um, from our other guests. Um, if they want to use the raise your hand, um, we can try to get in some of these questions and um, we'll kind of bounce them around the various panelists to see. Um, you can also enter questions into the chat if that's easier and we'll, we'll do the best we can. And in the interim, let's see, do we have... Um, Someone had asked about oysters growing on the edge of marshes with the mussels. And I think that was touched upon a little bit. Um, you can, the oysters tend to generally like to set on anything hard, I believe, as, as Mike pointed out, even you know pieces of wood, anything like that. But certainly mussels um, represent a nice hard structure. Um, All right, it's Robin. Hi, Robin. I have, I have a couple of... Um... Uh, questions. Um, read, uh, I'm sorry, um, Greg had sent over a link of the DEC's, uh, I guess it's like an oyster map or of a closed water certified water, their, their GIS um, map. I'll be sending that out to everybody as part of the follow up to this. And I would like to say on our, on the Save the Great South Bay YouTube channel, we had invited and had um, as guests at our speaker series back in during COVID. Uh, Roger Flood and um, and Charlie Flagg, who presented to us on drift patterns in the Great South Bay, as well as Bay Bottom Sonar Scan. So for anybody who's interested, those two videos reside on our YouTube channel. I'll send out links to those as well. I have a question regarding creeks. There are 50 creeks, though, so those freshwater sources leading into the Great South Bay. Is, um, is, is a creek a good site for, an, for oyster restoration? A great site. Um, for the, some of the reasons we talked about before with that freshwater input, the lower salinities, um, providing a disease refuge. Um, I guess the one thing you'd have to worry about in creeks, a lot of creeks are muddy. Um, so you might have a very, very, very muddy soft bottom that, that things will sink into. But um, uh, the intertidal zone in creeks is great, but you're, you're then again dealing with that you know, every few years, a big frost that might cause high mortality. Uh, but in general, I mean, I think creeks are a place to definitely focus on and, and look at. Thank you, Michael. Um, another question that was asked earlier, that maybe we can touch upon, there was, um, people have seen oysters setting on their seawalls. Um, and at times they, they survived the recent freeze, but other times in the past, they, they don't seem to survive. Um, the question is, they're wondering about the reef placement in terms of low tide exposure. Um, I think, Greg, you had touched upon that a little bit. Is there anything you'd like to add maybe specifically? Yeah, I mean, I saw that question earlier and I think a big part of it is how long are the oysters immersed, immersed out of the water? on a, say a cold night. There's usually a nighttime is when it's gonna happen. There's no sun, uh, it's clear. All the heat from the earth that maybe the sun gave up is going out to outer space. You know, there's no clouds to keep it down. And these single digit nights, even, even like uh, teens can really do damage. Oysters do have some natural antifreeze in the blood, but it's not gonna protect down to say five degrees Fahrenheit. There's no way. Interesting thing about bulkheads, uh, whether even if they're wood, but especially a vinyl or steel bulkhead, I would imagine is in contact with the earth behind it. And I'm wondering what that earth, that warmth literally of say a 50 degree uh, groundwater coming out at low tide and the earth behind it will do actually, to, it sounds ridiculous, but to warm the oyster up a little bit on you know, where it's connected to the bulkhead as opposed to being on an island, you know, Ridge Island in the middle of the bay where there's nothing the groundwater is coming up. Any, any, uh, even salt water in the the pore 
Sand is fr frozen and Bayman call it anchor frost. But you pick your anchor up on a cold morning and it's got a chunk of sand on it because the sand froze with the interstitial pour water to your anchor. So you're not gonna see that on a bulkhead. I think that's an interesting thing. And actually, uh, Ed Warner Jr. sent me a picture a few weeks ago of his bulkhead at the south end of Shinnecock Canal uh, in Shinnecock Bay, encrusted with oysters. It's insane how many there are. Uh, Mattatook Inlet, they're all over, like Strong's Marina uh, up on the, the west side of the Mattatook Inlet, Mattatook Creek, all over. They're on uh, vinyl uh, polyethylene pipes that bring water to the docks on plastic pipes that you think are so shiny, what would ever set on that? Well, the oysters did. So again, the, going back to the bulkhead thing, that's an interesting thing to me, the, the warming effect of the, the earth and the water behind the bulkhead. Yeah, that's that's potentially a good point. I, I do know, I want to direct a question over to Wade and Chelsea with DEC. Um, you mentioned it before, Wade, that there is some information on the website, on DEC's website, but what would be, if you could just kind of point out, what's the best process for um, someone looking to um, establish a, a sanctuary? Um, what's the best process for them to go about getting a permit? And do you recommend that they, even before they start filling out and applying for the permit, should they converse with DEC about um, their general ideas so that you can kind of guide them? Um, if you could just speak to that, that would be great. Sure. Um, well, uh, to start with, we don't generally issue permits to, to individuals for doing shellfish restoration. So, you know, it's, it's usually an uh, environmental NGO like uh, Prince of Bellport Bay, the Riches Bay Project, Billion Oyster Project. Um, and, and I think the, the, the first step would be for uh, a group like that, as uh, Thomas touched upon, is uh, talking to your your town. Most of the towns on Long Island have a have an a, environmental resources department. Who uh, you know, several of the towns they they manage shellfish in their town waters as well. Many uh, many require a a recreational or commercial harvester's permit. Uh, in addition to the, the state requiring a commercial harvester's permit. So uh, I think that would be a good first step as, as was pointed out, I think more than once during the talk, um, you know, the towns have ownership of the underwater lands and uh, often are involved in, in management programs. So that would be a, a, a first stop. And then, um, you know, yeah, a, 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 a basic proposal and then perhaps, you know, like a pre-application meeting with, with the group and with the town would be a great place to start. Great, thank you. I think that is very helpful and uh, good guidance for those interested. And yeah, it is a, an important distinction to make that it's not um, John Smith couldn't just apply. It's, it's typically a, a coordinated effort through uh, a, either a municipality or a uh, NGO such as Friends of Bellport Bay or um, Save the Great South Bay, these sort of things. Um, so we don't want DC being flooded with millions of, of questions from individuals trying to set up their own backyard sanctuaries. <laughs> um, Sorry, I, will, I, will, uh, I will add that to that though, that um, there is a, a living shorelines uh, process by which, you know, waterfront homeowners um, that, that do want to have a, you know, um, basically a, li a living shoreline as, as the, the seaward edge of their property with, uh, you know, introducing some Spartina plantings and, uh, you know, creating uh, maybe some, some riprap. Um, that there is a, a program for that. You can, you can do a, a search on DEC's website for living shorelines to find more information. And, you know, it's, it's possible that that within that living shorelines context, uh, uh, you know, a private individual, the, the homeowner could could incorporate, um, you know, spat on shell into that, along with the uh, the plantings of of uh, cord grass and, and whatnot. Great, thank you for that 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 good distinction, and that is uh, 
a nice way to so that individuals could possibly get involved. Um, so we do have a variety of questions that are coming in, many of which are related to next week's or the following week's um, presentation. So we won't get into that right now. Um, maybe we'll we'll go around the group of panelists and just um, if you guys want to just offer your some of your last minute um, thoughts or any any information that you'd like to just kind of summarize before we conclude for today. Um, Greg, why don't we start with you? Greg, you're muted. After two years, I still can't get it right. <laughs> Something that's been bugging me for like 30 years, and I'm anal retentive about words, is restoration. I hate the R word. Because, like, look at Peconic Bay. We're going to restore oysters to Peconic Bay. Well, there never really were oyster reefs in Peconic Bay. And we talked about this a little earlier. They were put there from Connecticut, Virginia, around uh, the city. I like to say shellfish renovation or uh, resource enhancement. The other thing I'll say is I'm not a big believer in water quality changes. Every oyster is going to help, yes. But we're building these little reefs. I mean, I am at least, that are like 21 feet square, say, or a little bit bigger a little bit smaller. And to say that I'm going to clean up a bay that's got even a three foot tide and a lot of a lot of inputs between homes and road runoff is, uh, I think it's disingenuous to, to keep harping on that. What I think is really what the, my main purpose is education, of course, but habitat creation. And, I, and maybe Wade could touch on it real briefly. I know when we put in permits, the first thing that Habitat protection, this is not Wade's department. This is habitat protection. They're gonna say, well, you're putting shell down and you're habitat trading. You're taking an icy sandy bottom where winter flounder spawn and you're putting shells there. Winter flounder are not gonna spawn in those shells anymore. I get it, but I'm creating a three-dimensional bed reef sanctuary that's got all these nooks and crannies that sand does not have. We're doing, uh, GoPro videos in East Mauritius for two years now. We've got GoPro, GoPros on the reef and at a control site nearby. And I could have told everybody this before we even started, you're gonna see a lot more activity on the reef with fish and invertebrates and things like seaweed uh, than you are on the control site with bare sand. It's, it's pretty simple. So again, yeah, we know oysters can filter 50 gallons a day. Well, it's a big oyster on a summer day. Right now they're not filtering hardly anything. So I just want to be a realist in all this. I, you know, that's, that's, that's my, my last take on it. Thanks, Greg. And, and that is a, a good distinction. I, I have, you know, at times with, with my programs, uh, you know, people have asked, well, how many oysters will it take for us to put it in to, to clean this body of water? Uh, if, if the unfortunate thing is our water bodies are not fish bowls, right? We, we constantly are adding more things to it, whether it's road runoff or wastewater, um, all these things. So we're constantly adding to things. Now, that shouldn't diminish our desire to be putting and continuing all of this habitat. Like you said, creating habitat is important. Now we're giving space for more organisms to be. The oysters are filtering water. They are helping. Um, but yeah, to, to say that, you know, we can put a certain amount to clean it up, it, you know, disingenuous is a good way to put it. it. It's helping and it's the right thing to do. And I think educating the future generations is the better thing. Changing our future generations mindsets is what I think needs to, is the big part of all of these programs and getting people to be more focused on um, projects like Friends of the Bay, Belport Bay, Friends of um, Mariches and that sort of thing. Um, so Thomas, I'll, I'll turn it over to you if you want to offer any of your last um, thoughts about today's today's session. Certainly, thank you. And uh, I completely concur with um, Greg Rivara and and Barry yourself. The um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try to execute a pirouette because I want you to see the back of my Friends of Belport Bay t-shirt. I don't know hopefully you can see it. Anyone can, can you all see that? Yes, yes we can see it. Touring Belport Bay habitat. So habitat restoration. So when I got into um, laying oysters and um, other shellfish on the bay bottom, 
my my mindset was, oh, this oyster is filtering, filtering, filtering as it does. However, what I've discovered be, by being on the ground is what happens when you get a cluster of shellfish, spat on shell, uh, single oysters. Um, we have planted scallops as well in, in, in eelgrass beds, the few that exist. I noticed that all sorts of other species flock to that area and it becomes a little microcosm in itself, a little habitat within that, that, that cage. for example, our cage systems. We have five bays over five bays and each bay has a bag of about 600 to 1000 baby oysters growing out. The number of species that we find in those bags from little eels to, to uh, blowfish to um, even some tropical fish that have come up and find themselves comfortable within our cage systems. That to me is the most inspiring part of our restoration efforts to see the ecosystem or the, the, uh, the, the habitat restore itself with all sorts of species. And that's really exciting for the kids that we take on to our, our cage systems. And, and, and with that said, I wanna go back to critical mass. Ken Daly and I had a, uh, from the Gino Machio Foundation had a beautiful conversation last night. And it's a, just a matter of putting shellfish in the bay because from a shellfish population, you will get the habitat above it. So I think it's, I think all boots on the ground, let's get those sanctuaries. So when the money and the oysters start flowing, we have a place to put them all along the South Shore estuary. Will they, will they be protected by men? And one other note, when you do choose your location for a sanctuary or a reef, talk to the local baymen. Um, taking bay bottom away from them is a very sensitive and very emotional uh, process. And, um, and we have a great, a good working relationship with our local baymen. They support what we do and they, they don't think we're a threat to uh, their livelihood. So make sure you communicate with the local baymen in your area and get them on board. In fact, we have one local clamor, John Gennaro, who's been on the bay since the early sixties. He is now um, working with us to restore habitat in Bellport Bay. Thank you, Thomas. That's a really good good point to make. It is important to work with your local baymen. They're, they'll be helpful. I know in, in Huntington and Northport, there's several baymen that I work with when we're we're seeding our shellfish. You know, I want their input on from year to year. What is a good place to be putting them? Um, and then certainly, if you're going to be establishing a sanctuary um, or an area. You don't want to take away prime real estate where they actively harvest. Um, so that I, that is that is really good advice to uh, make sure you combine um, your goals with their um, their plans and don't don't we don't want any conflict. We all we're all going for the same goal. Um, so with that, Mike, maybe I'll turn it over to you and you can give us some wrap up and some of your thoughts. Um, yeah, just following up from from Greg and Thomas, um, there's, you know, multiple benefits to shellfish restoration and oyster restoration. Um, improvements in water quality is one, whether it be increasing water clarity by filtering out phytoplankton, um, increasing rates of denitrification. Um, there's also, uh, of course, habitat, creating habitat, which is, which is a big goal, which um, uh, can help support lots of uh, commercially important fish and inver other invertebrate species. Um, there's there's um, uh, also um, rebuilding um, the fishery. So whether, whether it's the, our intent or not to rebuild the fishery, shellfish restoration, larvae will disperse through the, through the system, will settle other places. And uh, those places might be open to wild harvest. So um, there's an economic side to it too of, of um, helping to support the wild fishery. And I think um, one final point I, I want to make is um, uh, the function of restorative aquaculture also. So when you culture oysters, which a lot of people are doing in Great South Bay right now, there's a great um, uh, aquaculture program that the town of Islip runs um, and also in town of uh, Brookhaven. Um, so in Bellport Bay and, and Mauritius Bay, there's aquaculture going on. Oysters being farmed in cages perform a lot of the same ecosystem services that um, oyster reefs do. Um, they filter water, okay? So the oysters that, that, you're, that you're farming are still filtering water, just like the oysters on the reefs. Oyster farms also create incredible habitat, and there's been a, there's been a tremendous amount of work on that um, 
recently, um, over the last five, 10 years, just, uh, you know, just looking at habitat, whether it be video cameras or, or various sampling, but these oyster farms prov uh, provide structure, right? You're putting structure in the water that will provide hiding places for fish and other invertebrates and places for other ones to come eat. And maybe somebody, maybe somebody comes and mates there. Um, so these oyster farms are finding great habitat. The oysters in the oyster farms are also spawning. Okay, usually, unless, unless farmers are growing triploids, which I don't think most are on Long Island, but uh, um, uh, before they're harvested, um, they are usually releasing at least one spawn before harvest. And that spawn, the larvae will travel through the bay, help repopulate the bay. Um, and one other advantage of, of, uh, uh, of oyster farming that you might, um, that's a little different than on the reefs. With oyster farming, you're actually, in the end, harvesting the oysters. And when you do that, all that nitrogen and carbon that the oysters had sequestered into their tissue and shell is now being removed from the system. So there's a real nutrient bio extraction happening with farming. So um, the combination of bivalve restoration and restorative aquaculture um, really are some of our only in the water solutions to some of the of, uh, of the major water quality problems facing Long Island. Um, there's a lot of on the land solutions that that are being conducted right now. You know, Suffolk County um, has a lot of projects in place right now to, uh, you know, the whole sub watersheds uh, wastewater plan, but to upgrade septic systems and really trying to get to the source of nitrogen, the excess nitrogen that's polluting waters, trying to cut that down. But those land based initiatives will take decades to roll out. So even, um, even if you were to snap your fingers and upgrade every septic system on Long Island overnight, the residence time of the groundwater reaching, reaching the surface water of the base could be decades. So really the on the on the ground solutions that are attacking the sources of some of the problems will take decades to really have effects. And um, so if we're looking for in the water solutions to help mop up the mess now and do something now, bivalve restoration and restorative aquaculture are really our two, um, our two main options. And thank you again for, for inviting me. This was great, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Those are a lot of really good points. And you know, just if I could touch on the, the aquaculture component, I, I think a lot of times that is sometimes overlooked. You know, people don't realize the benefit, like you said, you know, you're putting hat structure in the water. So now you have a lot of habitat it provides a refuge for a lot of the juvenile um, fish, you know, the game fish um, that are, are also, you know, part of Long Island's recreational activities and part of the food chain, you know, providing more places for these instead of their, you know, we've lost a lot of salt marsh and eelgrass habitat where a lot of these organisms typically thrive. Having oyster cages in the water kind of helps facilitate that. And also it's, it's a, great food source, you, you know, there's a big economy. So, you know, it's providing um, jobs and perhaps people that once upon a time were baymen that now they're, they're shifting their roles over because, you know, wild harvest isn't as good. They're, they're still able to maintain that lifestyle and provide a, an important food source um, and for bio extraction, because now you're, you're pulling all that stuff out of the water as well. Um, I'd like to give Wade and, and Chelsea at, at DEC an opportunity if there's anything that they'd like to, to add to, to this conversation as, as we wrap up. Uh, sure, S certainly um, DEC and state are, are uh, very supportive of the concept of, of shellfish restoration. Um, you know, just in the last five years, I think we're, we're in the neighborhood of um, uh, somewhere between 12, 12 and $15 million invested in, uh, in projects between the Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project and uh, the Billion Oyster Projects Reef in off of uh, Soundview Park, off of the Bronx River. So um, yeah, and, I, I, and this, this series will continue over the next two weeks, but just also to let uh, the, some of the participants know um, there is a Shellfish Restoration Council that was formed as part of the Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project. And uh, though, a, though a meeting has not been set yet, uh, it's tentatively gonna be in, in April. Those meetings are open to the public. Um, if you are on DEC's website and search 
restore New York shellfish, you can find information about the council, the membership of that council, and um, that's where once the, the final date and time are nailed down for the, the next meeting, um, that's where that information will be posted. And, and really the council was created initially to uh, help guide these, these first restoration projects that were large scale restoration projects. Um, and now we, we have uh, Pew Charitable Trusts joining in and helping the state to come up with a uh, really a statewide restoration plan to apply uh, everywhere, uh, you know, tidal waters of the state from from the Hudson, you know, to Montauk. So um, again, those meetings are public, folks can participate. And uh, again, you could just uh, check that that web page I mentioned for more information. Great, thank you very much, Wade. Um, well, I, I'd like to thank all the panelists. This was a great discussion and, and thank all of the, uh, um, everyone that attended and asked the questions and turn it over to Rob and thank you so much for having all of us and uh, look forward to next week. Thank you, Barry. And thank you to all of our panelists for coming out today and spending your time with us. I think these conversations are really important to, um, to gather our experience and, and share. We learned a lot of things today about um, site selection. We will continue this conversation over the next two weeks and Fridays at 8 a.m. Uh, next week, we'll be establishing the sanctuary. How do you actually get the oysters from uh, from spawning into, into the sanctuaries. And then we'll follow up on Friday, February 25th with enhancing and measuring the success of projects. We often get the question of, you know, what's the number? What's the number of oysters it's gonna take to call your project a success? Um, so we're looking forward to those conversations. The Zoom links will go out. I'll send up, um, this, this meeting has been recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel. So feel free to refer back to it. Or uh, if you come up with questions, um, from this week's series, where we're happy to answer those at the at the onset of next week's um, Zoom call. So I wish everybody a pleasant afternoon, and and see you all next week. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye. Right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank Thank you. It was my great pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thomas. Thanks, Thomas.